Welcome everyone uh, to a mind maxing podcast. And we have a special guest with us here today, uh, John Labrie, who's the Dean and Associate Provost of Professional Education at Clark University. I have known John for a long time, well, a long time in my life, uh, probably 12 or 13 years. Um, and I've known John to be an innovator, uh, a very thoughtful person. Uh, I have quoted John uh, multiple times. And one of my favorite quotes is, if you want a seat at the table, uh, then you need to understand what matters to your institution. And if you're just doing things from a revenue standpoint, you're missing the boat. To have a seat at the table, you need to provide the rigorous education that your institution expects that you provide. And then you can start having those conversations. And that's one of my favorite things that I heard him say probably about seven or eight years ago. And, and uh, I have repeated that multiple times. Um, I've also known John to be um, funny and have a great sense of humor. And so I've enjoyed his levity uh, as we've commiserated and also celebrated uh, a variety of things that have happened over the years. And so I wanna welcome John and, and welcome all of you to our podcast called Mind Maxing. And we're just here to explore some ideas. Uh, today, we're gonna to explore uh, some reflections of 2020, um, given that this has been a, you know, an unusual year uh, to say the least. Um, and then also just sort of get a, a, a check-in in terms of where John's at and where he thinks education's at, or even potentially even where Clark is at, uh, and then some idea, ideas around the future. And so I'll start with uh, John, uh, welcome, and uh, tell us about some of your thoughts about 2020. Well, Lee, thank you, and thanks to MindMax for hosting these podcasts. Um, I very much appreciate the ability to participate in them. Um, asking uh, in a very tight environment what the last 11 months have been like um, is a little bit like um, asking Abraham Lincoln how his uh, time at the theater was <laughs> uh, the night he was assassinated. Um, you know, he, uh, it, it, there's been an awful lot this past year. Um, but here are some, I think, of my biggest reflections, and, and I'll go first on the micro level. Um, you work in higher education at, you know, and I've had the pleasure of working at diverse schools um, from Brown University to op op pretty open access public institutions at the University of Southern Maine years ago. And so over the years, I've seen a, a vast array of students from, you know, kind of working class, first generation, part-time adult students to, you know, those students that have uh, the privilege of coming from families with ample resources and, and uh, all of the preparation in the world. And what was the most striking thing across the board was that the diversity of our students, regardless as to economically where they sat, this pandemic has been difficult for them uh, on a very personal and heartfelt level. Uh, for poorer students, it's been in particular difficult because um, we discovered, for example, that we had students who um, had been operating without a laptop for a number of months because their laptop had died and they had not had the chance to purchase another one because they didn't have the resources. And so they had to literally be writing all of their papers on, on an iPhone. Um, and and then we had international students uh, who, according to our records, should have financially have been here on with ample resources to not only live, but also pay tuition, find themselves where their governments had frozen their parents' bank accounts and that there were travel restrictions or that airline tickets to their country were no longer available because countries were closing down around, around the world. So the disruption within our student population was really heartfelt. And it was a very big eye opener for me as to how vulnerable our student population is. Um, and even though we have a lot of resources or we think we have a lot of resources for our student population at all levels, um, we found ourselves really struggling um, to find ways to meet the needs of the student population that we serve. And in some cases that meant um, 
you know, providing financial resources for plane tickets. In other cases, that meant uh, giving somebody a laptop so they could actually, um, you know, have uh, equipment that they could operate on, or even keeping our library open so that uh, they had high-speed internet. On a personal reflection, that was really, for me, kind of an eye-opener. Uh, you know, when we made the decision at Clark to um, suspend classes and, and move to a remote offering, I, you know, made the general assessment that most of our students had laptops and this was not going to be a problem. Yet we spent the next two to three, four weeks really troubleshooting and solving these technical issues that, that our students had. And, and that revealed a, a wide array of issues um, that, that were masked, really, uh, in our normal day-to-day -day operations. So I have a deeper respect for the commitment of our students as they come to the table to our institutions. I think on the, on the macro level, on the larger scale issues, these moments in time are market shifting. And, and what I mean by that is that there are basic operating assumptions that every market works under. Um, you know, if you've taken a macroeconomics class, you know that the principle of reducing interest rates will grow productivity. Um, and that seems to be kind of a, a you know, pretty widely recognized kind of phenomenon. And, and most markets operate with these broad assumptions of how people and, and sectors will behave. Um, I think what's gonna happen here and what's happened over the last, really since the middle of March in the United States is that the market itself has been disrupted and we don't really know where that disruption is yet. It has not yet fully revealed itself. So we know that there are many institutions, including my own, who have invested enormous amounts of resources in working through the pandemic. Uh, Clark estimates uh, that its contributions to solving issues around the pandemic for our students uh, range between 11 and $12 million, uh, which is roughly about you know, eight to 9% of our operating budgets on an annual basis. Um, and, uh, and some institutions uh, are putting the number as high as $100 million. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's a lot of financial contributions that many of our institutions have made to solving issues with the pandemic. What hasn't been, what is still not known is how the market itself will be fundamentally reshaped and reconfigured and what kind of operating assumptions that we're going to be working under. And, and um you know, that's uh, both exciting and intimidating um, in the thing. So, you know, I'm left at the end of 2020 um, with those two baseline uh, reflections. Uh, mm -hmm. One on the micro level that our students are much more vulnerable than we had ever assumed. And, and two, um, that we are living in a period of time where our baseline assumptions on how our industry operates are really being disrupted and, and challenged. And um, clarity there is, is probably several years away before we fully understand the impact of what's happened in the last 11 months or so. I appreciate uh, those two perspectives. I, I, I think of the uh, data that I was reading and listening about, about uh, housing and shelter insecurity and food insecurity prior to COVID. Um, and, and the numbers were double digit percentages of housing insecurity and incredible, almost, almost a majority of students having some level of food insecurity in the course of a, a year. Um, and I have to believe that that's been exacerbated. Um, and then in terms of the market disruption, <clears throat> I have been wrong more times this year than maybe any year of my life. Um, <laughs> so fortunately, I, I haven't gone too far down a path of being wrong. But uh, yeah, some of the things that I thought would happen haven't happened. And, and uh, some of the things I thought wouldn't happen have happened. Many things that I thought would never happen have happened. But uh, yeah, it's, I think it's fascinating. So uh, in terms of that market, um, any thoughts on you know, where you got, if we, if we go to, I'll call it now uh, and now in the near term, you know, what's your stance in terms of the short term and where, where you think things are now and, and where you, you know, are trying, where you've gotten to in terms of addressing the near term, you know, situation? Yeah, I think in the near term, I think uh, there we do have some clarity. I think uh, 
let me kind of think through kind of in priority order kind of where I see kind of the major issues. I think for, again, let's start with the students and the market. Uh, uh, our students, I think um, with more than 10 million people uh, that have lost their jobs uh, and those jobs are not being replaced. Um, this morning's unemployment figures are showing a rebound in, in the growth of the unemployment rate uh, rather than, uh, than a shrinking of the unemployment rate. Uh, that kind of financial disruption will have an effect on our students and our uh, capacity to pay tuition. Um, so I think that institutions need to be thinking again very hard about how they go about resourcing um, tuition, both through scholarships and tuition remissions, uh, as well as leveraging federal financial aid. Um, on that, you know, I'm not seeing much movement on the federal government level, like we did in the 2009 recession, uh, for any large influx of new federal monies coming into the higher ed stream. Um, and if you think back to that period of time, even though there was a fair amount of disruption, we were thinking that two to three million people out of work um, back then was a major, uh, major financial issue. We've now got 10 million um, and the federal government this time has not really stepped up to the plate like it did back in 2009 and 2010 during the last great recession. Um, so I think institutions are gonna be bearing the brunt of the financial consequences of that uh, because the students will not be able to afford that. Um, this issue of financial aid and the cost of education was a major issue before COVID. Um, it had been growing rapidly. I think what's happened with the pandemic is the pandemic can also be called the great accelerator. It just took the next three to four years and compressed them over a matter of a few short months. So I think we're gonna have to answer that question, that fundamental question. How do we as an industry start providing for our students at a lower price point? And, and I don't think that that issue, it's both gonna be a short-term and a long-term issue. I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. I think that the um, uh, second major issue is that um, there is gonna be an echo of, uh, of the financial consequences for higher education. Um, most of us had fairly robust registrations and enrollments and the retention rates at most institutions have been relatively high. So the financial consequences in this fiscal year that we're currently in um, have actually been buffered a little bit. I think the bigger um, consequences financially are over the next several years. Uh, so the next two to three years, both public institutions and private institutions, I think are gonna suffer financially. Um, and the further away we get from the pandemic, the less appetite the public will have to be sympathetic to our need to uh, recover. So I do think that financially stressed institutions, um, are, again, will see a heightened level of that financial stress. And, and I do think that there will be institutions that will uh, probably shudder um, as part of, of that operation. Um, I do think that the, the increase in the demand of our students and the general public for an evaluation of ROI, our return on investment, what these degree programs will do um, is gonna be put on to hyperdrive. Um, we saw a fundamental shift in the 2009 recession from students asking about the quality of the academic programs and shifted to questions around what are the economic benefits of a particular academic program. And that's why, frankly, you saw this huge rise in graduate professional education after the last recession. I think that phenomenon will be across the board, both undergraduate and graduate. I think uh, parents, um, that pay for their undergraduate students are gonna be much more concerned about how their students find employment at the end of their four year cycle. And at the graduate level, um, I think we're gonna to have to present much more concrete and visible data on, on our financial performance for our students. And, and again, those trends existed prior to the pandemic, but I think that they will be much more accentuated post pandemic. And then who knows, I think this is also a period of innovation. Um, you know, um, and you're starting to see schools tinker around the edges, around academic policy, um, the testing regime uh, for admission, college admissions is the first, uh, 
place where a lot of schools are saying, you know, let's suspend this for a few years to see what, what happens. I don't think we're going back to a testing requirement um, where students will have to submit their SATs to be admitted to school. I do think that there, most schools will, will realize a new and different way for the admissions. I think that's actually a net good uh, for most of our students. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's gonna be a very interesting period of time uh, across the board, but uh, we have some very severe challenges facing us. Uh, this is gonna be a very sobering time for, for many of us in this sector. It's gonna be probably, uh, you know, over the course of the 30 years of my career, uh, probably one of the more difficult period of times that I can imagine ever facing, so. Um, so where is the college board going to get all those names to sell to people so they can send tons and tons of junk mail to to families of, of high school students? Um, no, in all seriousness, you and I have talked about all sorts of pivots, uh, both in terms of this year, but even prior prior to COVID. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you tremendously on the accelerator comment. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is this, that you use the term tinkering, and I think we've been tinkering, not so much around the admissions piece we have, but, but really around the, the term alternative slash micro credentials. And we have been, in my opinion, tinkering. And now it's time to do something. And, and, and it's not a tinkering, it's a full on, you know, fluid looking at things in a very uh, disruptive and alternative way, letting go of our past paradigms um, that we've been holding on to because we haven't needed to change them as, an ins as institutions. Right. There's been no reason to change. Um, and I think between the financial compression uh, in terms of the stressors on the institution and the families, along with, like you were saying, um, the validation of did this make a difference in someone's ability to, to get a return in a short period of time? Um, you put those two things together and, and schools that would have never thought of doing professional <laughs> application <laughs> kind of content are now gonna think hard about, do I provide something that's immediately useful to someone, so. That's right, that's right. You know, Lee, I, I'm struck that, you know, the, the place that I start thinking about of where I can go in the past to find examples of what we're facing in the current, because the past is often prologue. Um, and so it is helpful, I think, to be a student of history in, in moments like this. Um, and the certainly we haven't experienced kind of a pandemic, but there are examples, for example, um, post-World War II, where um, essentially 100% of all um, men of a cert of college age were were drafted. And because most universities were populated by men, many institutions around the country suspended operations for several years. And let me use my previous institution as an example, Northeastern University. Prior to World War II, Northeastern University had three branch campuses, uh, one in Connecticut, one in Rhode Island, and one in Western Massachusetts. Um, people forget that Northeastern had these branch campuses. They were extensions of both the law school and the business school. And of course, World War II happens. Northeastern, like many other institutions, shut down for a period of time. I think it was a two-year period. Um, and, and everybody goes to war uh, and, and is engaged in the war effort. Upon return, these institutions had some financial problems, um, largely because they weren't especially private institutions. So Northeastern um, essentially jettisons these three branch campuses and, and essentially says that they can't, there's a big story behind it, but essentially they can't support uh, three branch campuses. Um, and those, those institutions actually use that moment in time to petition their own states to become institutions in their own right. So an institution not very far from you is one of those institutions, Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. And Roger Williams has uh, came out of that co-op tradition that came from Northeastern. But today it's a vibrant, it's been in existence for you know, 75, 80 years. Um, and it, uh, it spawned these moments in time, spawn innovations and spawn new things. And we really don't know where this is going. 
Um, but I think it can be a very exciting period of time if you keep your ear to ground and, and watch carefully and, and, uh, and, and not insist on business as usual. I think those institutions that insist on business as usual, I think are gonna be sadly surprised um, four or five years from now where they can't financially recover and they can't economically recover to the same stature that they were. Um, just some reflections of the past there. No, I think that's super, super thoughtful. Uh, and I do, I think about this actually relatively often back to land grants and then mm -hmm. the MIT professional. And then, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, really looking at what you talked about that post-World War II, which led into these very, they needed, to, they needed to find a way to give people uh, an opportunity to use the GI money. And so then we had these night classes and then these night classes without a credential, which then generated the community college, higher ed, you know, 1963 higher ed act that, that gave people an ability to have this incremental credential, um, which the micro-credential, I'll call it fragmented industry that it is right now, has been referring back to, um, but I think it's time for a, another, and I don't know if it's a higher ed act, but uh, there's a time for another way of, of looking at credentialing. I also do a lot of work, as you know, in the California uh, system, and you know that master plan has been overwhelmed for well over a decade, if not two decades, um, and it's not able to serve its, its you know, intent uh, the way it would like to, um, despite trying. Um, but the, the, maybe there's another way. And, and I all, I use the term horse bill all the time when I talk about, you know, a four-year degree and a two-year degree. And in today's world, we're down to, I mean, I remember commercials used to be 90 seconds long. Now a commercial is less than 15 seconds. Um, so that, that analogy applies, you know, an analogous way to how people think about consuming all sorts of job aids and information and so forth. So um, corporate, corporate training has gone there a long time ago. Uh, corporate training used to do these big, long institutes. IBM did them, GE did them, you know, and, and they were they, you know, you'd go away for a month. Uh, and now it's everything is performance support and just in time and pushed, pushed out to the individual. So uh, I think higher ed has an opportunity to step into that realm. So, right. You know, it'll be also interesting to see how the pandemic has affected cities. So if you look at the growth of higher education and the strengthening of the institutions in higher education, they've been almost exclusively in the urban cores of major urban centers. Mm -hmm. uh, the big enrollment problem has been kind of in more rural America. Um, and we think about the events as we're recording this, the events of yesterday, January 6th is kind of fresh and in the mind and, and seeing the insurrection happening, um, you know, and, and looking at the political divide in this country between urban and rural, I'm always struck that the places where higher education is struggling is in the, is in the rural areas, where it's thriving is in the urban areas. But this pandemic may have shifted things. Um, you know, the pandemic first hit very hard in cities um, and it spooked people. Um, now, do people kind of flee from the cities? They've been hotbeds of innovation and, and economic drivers for their regions. So I think that there's a lot of momentum and, and, and to, to keep things in the urban core. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if there is a disruption amongst the urban rural mix in higher education, if we continue on in the trend of seeing these urban schools continue to be strengthened whereas the rural schools are continue to be weakened. I remember during the Obama administration, the talk about really an effort to try and provide broadband uh, and really the broadband deserts, um, uh, like food deserts and education deserts, they're all, there's a, there's a lot of them. And, and uh, it, it really hasn't been addressed. And maybe, you know, AT&T satellites are gonna change that, who knows? I mean, it may not come through actual wiring. Broadband may come from 5G, I don't know. I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, but I, I am aware that, that 
not everyone can get broadband access uh, these days. And, and that is almost a requirement. Like you were mentioning, it's not just the laptop uh, for certain students. It's also you know, uh, streaming access to be able to oh, do yeah. something like, like a Zoom session. Uh, so. so if we look a little further forward, John, um, you know, maybe it's 2022, maybe it's even further than that um, in the you know, musings of, of John Labrie. And I know you, I know you have lots of musings. So, uh, what are some of your thoughts about you know, in a little further out as you as you think about uh, what's possible as this acceleration happens? Well, some things we know. Um, we know that at the traditional undergraduate student age, we've got this demographic cliff that hits in 2025, and and is sustained for at least a 15 year period, where the general college age student population it drops by you know some 15 to 18 percent depending on where you are in the country and doesn't recover um, so the gradual one or two percent decrease that we've been seeing in the undergraduate population the freshman class I think continues and and that we knew already knew was going to cause some long-term heartburn uh, for a lot of institutions there's a couple of possible scenarios um, that actually, either amplifies that demographic cliff or actually solves it. Um, and one of it, one of which, and both of them involve money um, and you know, probably federal money, but federal and state money. Um, because even if you combine all of the philanthropy in the United States, you just don't come close to the economic impact of, of uh, the ability of the federal and state governments to contribute financially to a particular sector. So this is not something we're going to fundraise ourselves out of. Um, one could imagine that this economic, this demographic cliff just creates economic turmoil amongst a lot of institutions. And you see a dramatic pairing back or mergers and acquisitions of schools. So that 10 years down the road, we're looking at a third fewer institutions across the country. I mean, you could see that. Um, you could see a, a resurgence of community colleges and trade schools that are much more ROI oriented, much more practical, much more job ready. You could see the population saying that's more predictable for me and that's where I'm gonna go. So you could see this growth in community colleges and, and technical institutions. Um, you could also see a series of federal and state policies that essentially say, um, we really need to take seriously the economic plight of our rural communities. You mentioned broadband, I think that that is very likely to happen, but also infrastructure. Um, and, and the need to bring rural America into the success story of the new age um, around technology and, and the new economy. Um, that will necessitate a flood of resources for higher education. And, and you could see a resurgence in, in those institutions, especially state institutions that serve large regions of rural America. Um, I, I don't think you're gonna see the demise of the urban core. Uh, I, think, uh, you know, I think there's too much creativity and too much innovation that have come out of that. So all the technical and technological gains that we've seen come out of our urban cores, especially through things of biotechnology and, and, and national security, I think that's going to stay in place. But one can imagine a number of scenarios where it isn't so much a doomsday scenario as it is kind of a, a reconfiguration of a new market. Um, very similar again to World War II when those uh, veterans came back home and started flooding the markets. Uh, you saw whole communities grow up around these new institutions that were founded, all these community colleges that really have their roots in, in, in the World War II veterans coming back uh, to education. Um, you could see, I, I do think that this pandemic has been that disruptive uh, on the scale of, of, of World War II and, and, and really the economic uh, disruption that was caused by that, so. Oh, I think, I think it's, more disruptive potentially. There's yeah. more, more deaths already. Uh, I mean, we're right. We're we're this month will be eclipsing all the deaths in World War II, uh, yeah. Yeah. and and 
and it probably will last as long. Uh, yeah. It's not going to be a one year, uh, one year and we're done. It's going to be yeah. years. So, you know, Lee, I haven't touched on one thing that's near and dear to my heart, and um, and that is our international students. Mm -hmm. um, we have had a fantastic 30, 40 year period of time where the United States has been overwhelmingly dominant in the international student market. Mm -hmm. uh, there are signs where there's gonna be some moderation there. Obviously, politically, the geopolitical situation, especially the tension between the United States and China uh, are, will fundamentally, I think, disrupt student markets there. Uh, but I don't see the resiliency of higher education in the United States um, losing its luster across the board with international students. Um, we forget that other countries are suffering greatly from this pandemic as well. Um, and they were starting from a, not a position of strength, they were starting from a position of weakness. Um, so American higher education will probably rebound quicker than a lot of other places. Um, and because of the resiliency and the diversity of our higher education markets, I, I do think international students will continue to flock to the United States. Th these things are on a pendulum. And we've just kind of, I think, hit the apex of a pendulum that is anti-immigrant, anti-international students. And, and I do think that we're gonna start seeing kind of the swing back. Um, and institutions in the United States have always been very welcoming of students from outside of their boundaries. And in fact, that's been the story of higher education since its founding uh, back in Oxford and Cambridge and the Sorbonne. Uh, international students have always driven higher education. Uh, so wherever quality exists, wherever students can get a high quality education is where the international students will go. And so if we focus on our quality and our standards and our return on investment, I think we're going to be okay on the international student recruitment side. Yeah, as I was listening, you know, early in in the COVID pandemic, uh, and also like you talked about the trade wars with China, uh, one of the things that I read was about uh, the we were talking about the supply chain disruption, and the thing that is most imported exported is services or our services. And services involve people. Uh, and in higher ed, it involves knowledge, it involves information, and it also involves people. And so the free movement of both ideas and people are, I think, core to having that international um, interchange, let's put it that way. Um, and, and, and I do agree, we've done a lot in the international markets as well. And, and uh, you know, we're still always you know been looked at even through this last several years uh, as an you know desirable place to study um, and and whether it's uh, in person or online it's much harder to pitch the uh, online uh, to an international student because they're also generally looking for a, a cultural experience in the United States which is part part of the overall experience and actually I'd like to go back to that specifically because uh, as a parent of a, a college age uh, undergrad right now, uh, two of them actually, one deferred this year and one you know, is in her junior year. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the value prop to a family right now? Uh, because the value prop of an undergrad education or even a professional degree in person um, includes a lot of that interpersonal interaction and, and so forth that has been stripped away uh, through COVID. So what are your thoughts on how higher ed maintains or uh, can maintain that value prop to families? Yeah, I think that there's, uh, so I think it breaks out from an economic perspective. I think affluent families uh, will wanna continue the traditions of the last hundred years where they send their son or daughter off to a residential um, institution for a four-year undergraduate experience. And, and there's a lot of strengths in, in that model. Um, it certainly allows students to have a moment of, of reflection, a moment of focus. They are given the space away from their families to redefine themselves. 
Um, and so I do think that economically there will be a certain segment of our population that will prioritize that and will be able to afford it. Um, but I do think for the vast majority of undergraduate students, um, this is going to be kind of a, a, a moment probably not unlike what I experienced uh, as a first generation college student. So I, I don't know if you know this, but um, I started school, failed, uh, went back home, uh, re-enrolled in an open access institution, um, didn't have enough money to support myself. So would start taking one class or taking semesters off so I could work. And so my undergraduate degree ended up comprising three different institutions in 10 years. Um, luckily, I was in the University of Maine system where all of my credits eventually were able to be consolidated into one credential. I think we're going to see that type of mobility and that type of movement around. And that's where your micro credentialing mm -hmm. concept becomes really interesting. If we can figure out how to have these micro credentials behave more like Lego blocks rather than standalone items, you know, when, when we currently are thinking of a micro credential or even a certificate, we think of it as a standalone item. Um, and Historically, that's what we've done. You know, we've, we've again, tinkered around the edges. We've taken the micro-credentials and made sure that they are a concentration within a larger master's degree. So if you get the certificate, then you can matriculate easily into the master's degree at a later point in time if you want. But I do think that as an industry, if we can figure out how to start developing these micro-credentials in some standardized way that they can be attack, attached to others then there are institutions already that exist, Excelsior being one of them, and a couple of others in the Canadian system, uh, Thompson Rivers uh, up in British Columbia, um, that are able to consolidate all of these units, all of these what we call credits, which may not be credits in the future, but that may be some sort of listings of competencies, and, and are able to kind of build things that are able to be recognized in, in the employment sector. Um, right now, the employment sector uses the credential as a screening tool. You need a bachelor's degree for this, you need a master's degree for that. If, you know, and I'm going through applications and if people don't have a master's degree, you know, I just move them off to the side. I don't take much look at them. But I do think that increasingly as, as um, our economy is much more diverse than it was, um, for experiences, educational experience and learning experiences transcend the classroom. Um, I think employers are gonna become much more sophisticated and, and have become much more sophisticated in identifying talent and competencies rather than credentials. Um, you know, I'm, one of the projects that I'm really proud of uh, doing at Clark is uh, Department of Labor um, grant where we're providing pre-apprentice and apprenticeships in the information technology space. So 5,000 pre-apprenticeship programs and 1,000 apprenticeships over the course of the next four years in the IT sector. The IT sector is not a trade, yet it is something that requires both analytical skills and math skills and traditional book skills, but also requires students to spend time with professionals who are in the IT industry to learn the craft of information technology. And so things like apprenticeships, I think are really gonna come back into their own, but come into their own from a much more academic perspective rather than just simply the trades where apprenticeships are things that community colleges do. Um, whereas, you know, suddenly, one could imagine an apprenticeship in biotechnology, uh, an apprenticeship in computer science, you know, because a lot of what we need in our industries right now is being driven through experiential education and supported by our traditional academic framework. Um, but employers really want people who know what they're gonna need to do on day one and they don't want to really spend the next three to four years retooling students who have just spent four years in the classroom, not really doing practical 
uh, applications of the theories that they've spent time mastering. So I do think we're, again, these trends, ex I keep coming up with this comment, but all of this existed before COVID. Um, but COVID really has really, I think, accentuated um, our need to re-examine all of these attributes and, and, and move forward in, in, in what could be a new renaissance for higher education. I hope so. Uh, I think, I think it could be is to be determined. Uh, you still have those Northeastern, uh, that Northeastern DNA in you. I can hear it. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's um, something I'm exceptionally proud of. Yeah. Um, because I do think that much of what we did uh, at Northeastern um, had its roots in listening mm -hmm. um, to industry, but also listening to parents and listening to students and, and really taking a hard analytical view about where these markets are growing. Um, and so it really was informative. Uh, it was, a, a, for me, a transformative moment in time. So as we ramp up today, just some, any closing reflections, thoughts, comments, uh, you know, it's a, it is a, a very interesting time in history. And, and uh, I heard this early on in March that it's not usual that you are aware that you're living a very special moment in history yeah. while you're actually in the moment. Usually it's yeah. upon reflection, uh, but we've, we've been in something that we know is going to be remembered for decades, if not centuries. So any uh, closing thoughts you'd like to, like to end with? You know, I've spent, you know, the last, you know, time with you kind of musing of, of things that could be or things that, that are and trying to make sense of the last 10 months. But I think the one thing that I, I that I always come back to late at night when I'm kind of processing my own day is that we need a greater sense of humility in our industry. Humility and, and understanding that while we can be op optimistic about the future, um, we also have to be humble enough to understand that we don't always have all of the answers. And our ability to improvise and pivot and shift, in my mind, are, are examples of being humble enough to say, this is our plan, this is where we wanna go. But two weeks later, and COVID was a great example of that, you know, we make a whole series of plans on day one. On Tuesday, we'd come in and go, wait a second, those don't fit anymore with the new reality that we have. And so we, and, and over the course of the months, I don't know how many plans uh, that we configured that, you know, very quickly, got jettisoned and thrown out the window. And, and I do think that we need a spirit of humility to hear and listen to what is being said around us. Many times in higher education, we spend enormous amounts of time and energy developing our grand plan. And once that plan is developed, we execute it. Mm -hmm. And when markets and situations are stable, you can execute because your baseline operating assumptions don't change. But I do think that we're in a period of great transformation and, and I think some humility here to be able to say, you know, a couple of weeks into a new plan saying, is this really the right thing for us to be doing? And so, um, you know, the ability to be nimble, you know, people have talked about being agile uh, and nimble, but, you know, baseline, I think for academics, that's rooted in humility, the humility to say, we thought we were right, but we maybe are not. And so maybe we need to rethink this. And, you know, that's for me anyway, is probably, you know, the, the thing that I keep coming back to um, very late at night, um, trying to process all of the information that I've taken in over the course of the day um, that we don't really know what will all turn out. We just need to be ready for it. Uh, whatever that is. Well, I want to thank you, John. Uh, this is terrific, and it's always great to spend time with you. I, I uh, even if it's not in person. Uh, so, the the new the new normal of connection, whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving or you know Zoom chats with people and friends and so forth. So, 
Um, well, I, I feel like I've seen you more in the last uh, six or eight months than I have um, over the past 13 years that we've known each other. So. I, I know it's funny. This Zoom does bring it bring it together more easily. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate having the opportunity to spend some time with you on this.